Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Thank you very much for coming along to uh, 2017 annual lecture in honour of Professor Jackie Mason. My name is Graham Mori. I am the director of the Mason Institute. As many of you will know, this year is particularly poignant because Professor Mason died in January um, at the age of 97, um, having been uh, an honorary fellow of the School of Law for the past 22 years and teaching right up until the last sort of, um, four or five years of his life. Um, we have on the Mason Institute website a book of condolences if you'd like to um, pass on your, your, your comments and your wishes. As, and we also have an ongoing series of blog articles which are designed to honour Ken's intellectual contributions. And we'd be delighted if anyone was interested in uh, taking part in that whole process. Now, Ken, um, there's many things I can say about Ken, but Ken um, played hard, he loved his Bombay, well, Bombay Sapphire Gym, but he also worked hard. I've never met anybody who has a more impressive work ethic, perhaps except with the, the example of tonight's speakers. Um, <laughs> Ken was unapologetic um, about his commitment to quality, but also his commitment to being a public academic, somebody who not only is um, <clears throat> dedicated to research and teaching, but also about seeing how the work that we do in universities actually has a much wider and important social impact. And I can think of no uh, better example of this in current medical legal ter uh, uh, field as Professor Jonathan Montgomery. Professor uh, Montgomery is the Professor of Healthcare Law at UCL. He is the former Chair of the Human Genetics Commission and until very recently also the Chair of the Nuffield Council on Bioethics. And Jonathan continues to be the Chair of the Health Research Authority. He's going to share with us his um, experiences of those and other um, contributions and how they can impact not just on academic understandings but also on the real world with respect to and social contract and what it might mean for new bearings in health research ethics. Jonathan, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Graham. Um, and it's a great privilege and slightly emotional to be here to, um, to speak this evening. I'm very grateful to you and the directors for the invitation. Um, but above all, I uh, would want to mark my gratitude to Ken Mason for the inspiration that he's provided me individually and I'm sure many others. Um, I've spent most of my working life on the subject that he called medical law and ethics. Um, uh, and I'm going to talk to you this evening uh, on some reflections on the Declaration of Helsinki, the World Medical Association's Declaration about Research Ethics. And I originally got to know that because it was in the appendix of the textbook on medical law and ethics that uh, Ken Mason, Samuel Cole Smith at that stage, and now um, Graham and colleagues uh, wrote. But I want to suggest that uh, we're at a stage where we need to reimagine the terms of uh, research ethics that are expressed uh, in that document. And I'm going to suggest that there are um, two types of reasons that lead me to uh, the feeling that we probably need to do that. First of all, there are various ways in which the Declaration of Helsinki and the edifice of research ethics and governance that's been built on it seem to me to be either under pressure and strain or arguably to have uh, ceased to be plausible in relation to the way in which research is actually conducted. Um, and that's a set of concerns that relates to the need to revisit some of the substance of, of our consideration of, of ethics. Um, and I'm going to flesh out um, what seem to be the most salient tensions in that category, uh, which I'll describe as the new bearings that we need to take into account as we plot uh, a new course. Um, the second strand of thinking um, explores the extent to which the governance structures and ideas that, that we've built um, need to be reconstructed uh, in the future. And I see the Declaration of Helsinki as a, a form of covenant from the uh, world's doctors that's offered to uh, humankind in order to suggest that we could be confident that the breaches of trust that were exposed in the Nuremberg war crime trials um, won't happen again. Uh, Ken was a devout Roman Catholic, uh, and I'm adopting a biblical idea there. You want to think of the rainbow that um, the Bible describes as being displayed at the end of the flood uh, as a promise to Noah and the other survivors of the ark that never again would mass destruction be visited uh, on the planet. 
Now, the point about that covenant is it's a unilateral covenant. It's a statement from medicine um, built on a fairly patrician paternalism, um, a paternalism that normally irritates bioethicists uh, over the, the decades uh, of uh, discussion. Uh, and you can see that unilateralism also apparent in the societal response to ethical problems. So uh, we picked up the idea of a social license to describe the tolerance that society has uh, of the research enterprise. Uh, and down south of the border, as uh, Graham and other colleagues have shown, we rather blew that social license in relation to the use of health data uh, in the initiative known as Care.Data. Uh, and what that showed was how fragile that social license was. It can be withdrawn, uh, but like the medical covenant, the social license is essentially unilateral. It's the societal response to uh, an offer. So I want to suggest that we not only need to revisit the Helsinki Declaration's uh, uh, substance, but we should also revisit the unilateralism that's implicit in, on the one hand, we might think about health research ethics, and on the other hand, we might think about the acceptability of that to society. And that's why I got interested in the social contract paradigm. It holds out the promise of a way of thinking about how we can bring those stakeholders um, together uh, and might enable us to provide a process by which we could reconstruct uh, a more robust uh, understanding, uh, a more mutual understanding, uh, of the basis for health research ethics for the future. And I borrowed the phrase new bearings uh, from a book of literary criticism by F.R. Leavis in which he challenged the complacency of 19th century uh, English language literature uh, in the light of modernism such as T.S. Eliot trying to reconstruct um, a new understanding, a new seriousness as he talked about it, about the connection between literature and life. So in essence, that's what I'm trying to take you through in the next 40 minutes or so this evening. The suggestion then is that we might need to rethink the paradigm that lay behind the Helsinki Declaration. And the first half uh, of my talk is going to explain why I think that has become anomalous. That's a term borrowed from Kuhn's theory about how scientific uh, revolutions might emerge. But the first signs we see uh, are a series of anomalies. So I want to suggest, first of all, that uh, behind the paradigm that's enshrined in Helsinki um, are two things that we shouldn't see with quite the same priority previously. The management of risk of interventions uh, and the idea of conflicts of interest. And I want to pick up a few characteristics of those anomalies that I think are important going forward. So the first assumption is that paradigmatically, Health research is about doing probably nasty things to people. So if you read the Declaration of Helsinki, uh, it talks about improving diagnostic and therapeutic procedures. Um, it does go on to recognize understanding etiology and pathogenesis of disease, and then quickly goes back to well, what we're after is prophylactic diagnostic and therapeutic methods that should be continuously challenged. So there's a sense in which we're worrying about doing things um, to people. And you can see that through lots of the documents and practices of research ethics, which characterize interventions in terms of the degree of risk they involve. They ask what's being done in the name of research, which is different from what would have happened in relation to clinical care. Um, we look at the way in which the risks of interventions are described in consent form. So a lot of what we think about in terms of research ethics is built around the idea that what we're worried about is what's being done to people um, differently. And then the second assumption that we make uh, is that we're dealing with a situation in which there's a fundamental and irreducible conflict of interests. Um, the Declaration of Helsinki has developed over a, a, a number of years, and when they were looking at it in Edinburgh in 2000, one of the things that happened was that they looked at the additional concerns that people had when you had a combination of research and clinical care. Uh, whereas previously there'd been a sense that Trying new things in the interest of the patient were not really quite the same as research. You didn't need to worry in the same way. They were the exercise of clinical judgment uh, in the interests uh, of the patients. The Declaration of Helsinki has brought out the realization that sometimes people do awful things to people 
claiming to be uh, in the context of science. And we hark back to the type scandals that Papworth identified in the UK and Beecher uh, in the US. We don't very often remember that they were identified from within the profession uh, as opposed to outside it. We don't very often recognize that the mechanisms of research ethics committees were designed to enable medicine to keep its internal house in order, or if you look at the UK, to grab US money, because you couldn't get US money unless you'd got the internal house uh, in order. And it's not so obvious, therefore, that the assumption of conflict of interest uh, is quite so fundamental. And because we focus so much on that conflict of interest, we probably misread some important elements of some of the other research scandals. So the infamous Tuskegee and Guatemala experiments, um, we think about, about government abuse. We downplay the extent to which that deals with institutionalized racism. I want to come back a little bit later on to the very intriguing and interesting uh, history of Henrietta Lacks uh, and the Gila cell line. Uh, which featured quite prominently at the IAB conference uh, late last year. Now, that can be looked at in terms of a story about conflict of interest and scientific exploitation, but you're also looking at a situation where the only access that she had to care was access through a research hospital. Um, you're looking at the situation where the interventions initially uh, used were hoped to benefit her. Um, and actually what you have is a context of silence, disadvantage, uh, poor access to care, which of course wouldn't happen in modern America. So I want to ask questions about the extent to which what flows from that fundamental assumptions uh, is under a bit of pressure. And for me, these five things are the most salient. This idea of conflict of interest and separation uh, is much less clear in much research practice than it used to be. I want to think about the extent to which we should worry about things we do to people as opposed to what we find out about them and how we link that with data. I want to think about the fact that this isn't just, if it ever was, medicine. Uh, and that raises some challenges about how we need things, move things forward. I want to suggest the idea of separation between the research enterprise uh, and aspects of clinical care and resource allocation is not as distinct as it used to be. And I want to suggest to you that the worries that we have about things being done badly are being supplanted by our worries about things not being done that we need to do. So quickly fleshing out um, those sorts of uh, ideas. There's a linguistic change that uh, many have uh, focused on as we stop the idea that somehow people are the subject to research under the medical gaze uh, and they become uh, more participatory. And that in part is about the language of respect. But increasingly, we're also seeing and encouraging and trying to incentivize a much closer collaboration and co-production of the research enterprise. So at the Health Research Authority, which is responsible only for England, um, you know, we try and monitor the extent to which participants are involved in research design, and we try and find ways to uh, make that uh, encouraged uh, and give people an easier time with research ethics committees. The uh, new head of the National Institute for Health Research in England, uh, Professor Chris Whitty, uh, has tried to prompt NHR to think more about investing in the health needs of the future, and less in terms of driving things by scientific curiosity you know, of researchers. And routinely, policy documents talk about um, the idea that we should involve participants uh, and patients in the design of research uh, and its priorities. That raises interesting challenges about whether or not that leads to research on things that people would like to see happening, even when maybe the science is, is not so strong. Uh, and there's a significant stream of demand-led, participant, patient, community-led funding for research now. Uh, and that's led to challenges about whether or not the research is funded has sufficient power, whether you can get um, charities to pool their researches in order to try and promote a more effective scientific enterprise. Uh, and emerging the interesting and more sophisticated discussions about how we should respond to participant-led research, which is not bound by the sort of government structures that professionals are bound by, but may be just as uh, prone to the type of power imbalances as we worry about between uh, professional researchers uh, and participants. 
So that raises challenges to the models of research ethics that we've looked at in terms of where we think the power and the vulnerabilities um, sit. It makes it more difficult to say we shouldn't be allowed to give people the offer to go into a research project because it's too risky for them. That's a pretty paternalistic judgment, particularly if they are pushing for the use of the technologies. And pushes us into what the Nuffield Council on Bioethics in its report on children in research um, phrased in terms of thinking more about the fairness of invitations than about the risk of the interventions um, themselves. Which takes me on to the question about interventions. The way in which we prioritised our worries about what are the risks of doing things to people has led to some practices that, when you step back slightly, don't necessarily seem uh, so obviously in the interests of patients and participants. So first of all, and possibly as much for workload issues through research ethics committees as other things, we've identified a series of things that we don't think need to go through the hoops of research approval because maybe they don't involve doing anything different. They're only service evaluations uh, or audits. Um, we don't put through um, this things that are just seem to be new ways of doing clinical care, which means that we drive things away from structuring research uh, in order to find out the best results. Uh, and those are all to do with practices of research governance, which have grown out of the idea that we want a manageable process driven by a particular type uh, of research. I think our lack of attention to the importance of thinking about research as data, because mostly the reason why we do things to people is to find out things we can then convert into data. Um, when we do genomic sequencing, we're converting things into data. We increasingly want to connect the data we get from our individual research projects with other data that's otherwise available. And we should stop thinking about the question about whether we are breaking uh, relations of confidentiality and think more about the acceptability of the intrusions into privacy uh, and more about what is good governance for the use of data. And the emergence of big data technologies throws into question some of the things that research ethics committees have routinely looked at. So typically a research ethics committee will um, uh, be thinking about what is new, but actually they not need to do anything new. If we could unlock the data in the health system, we might learn, at least in relation to the generation hypotheses, quite a lot of information without doing anything new to anybody, um, and that could uh, reduce the risks of research, but we need to know whether we can do that um, appropriately. Research ethics committees will often ask whether or not the study that they've been looked at can actually answer the question that's put. But you don't necessarily have hypothesis-driven research in the context of the new data processes. We worry about the extent to which research involves uh, surveillance, and yet we live in a society where we uh, are under surveillance pretty much all the time. I've just turned off my mobile phone, so I'm probably not being recorded, but I think Graham's is still on, so uh, that's probably okay. And that raises a question of whether we should carry on thinking about the connection of our health research ethics with the nature of interventions and uh, health uh, techniques, or whether we need to connect it with other types of ethical challenge, uh, for example, challenges around the proper management of, of data uh, and the ethics of data science, something which the government in Westminster is committed to establishing a council for and has gone very quiet about. Big data then raises a third of the characteristics that I think put the medically dominated declaration of health thinking model uh, under challenge, which is it isn't just about doctors. I've already hinted at this with the participant-led research, that participants who don't necessarily feel any loyalty to the medical values uh, are becoming more and more important in the design uh, of projects. We also know, as we get into the analysis of data, that there's a whole series of key players uh, in understanding what we can learn uh, from health data who are not part of this um, biomedical tradition uh, and therefore have no particular reason to buy into the research ethics that has developed out of medicine uh, and its uh, history. I don't want to overplay this because I think it's always been like that. Um, one of the challenges that, that law is grappling with at the moment around uh, healthcare issues 
Uh, is the idea somehow that there is such a thing as a specifically medical decision? And according to the Supreme Court, in a case slightly unfortunately called Montgomery, uh, but a case from this part, this side of the border, um, picks up the idea that there are some things that are specifically medical decisions, and in deciding what to tell people isn't one of them. But when you try and break down what actually a medical decision is and what disciplines it uses, um, there's not much that is distinctively medical, and the same is true of health research. You'll have a statistician if you're doing quantitative um, analysis. Um, we've already moved uh, to industrial scale research driven by industrial interests so that you have teams of people dealing with things which who may be scientists but they're not necessarily medical scientists. Um, we've long involved a whole range of people other than those who would be professionally committed to a World Medical Association document uh, in research. So it's not that this is new. We've identified for a long time the inadequacy of our investment in bioinformatics and understanding genetics. We've already identified the importance of institutions that sponsor or uh, host research in terms of governance, none of whom necessarily need to buy into a biomedical model. So we've got ourselves in a situation where the context of health research brings in a significant number of non-health uh, values uh, and challenges and calls into question a governance system that assumes that the sanctions arise around professional responsibilities. So it raises a challenge, if we do think these are the right ethics, how do we make them meaningful uh, and how do we make them bite on these new players? Or maybe the question is, should we listen more to the ethics that they recognise in their practices uh, and take them more seriously in the context of health? research. So the point about new kids on the block is that we have a model generated around thinking about medicine and the practice is no longer focused necessarily in the same way. We also have a situation in which real world concerns about getting on with things and clinical care are much more closely integrated into thinking about the research enterprise than the Helsinki model which suggests they can be kept reasonably separate suggests in part, this is about lack of memory, historical memory. The governance system for research that is strongly influenced by the thalidomide tragedy and the perception that untested medicines do great harm. But that's significantly forgotten uh, in a movement to accelerate access to medicines, to bypass what are seen to be bureaucratic <coughs> and disproportionate um, protections. Uh, and you see it in the US particularly in terms of the pushing of the compassionate usage provisions, even legislation saying that people should have the right to try. And it's not just the US, you could see this as an explanation of the approach to mitochondrial replacement therapy, where it's driven by families pushing parliament um, to say that we know enough about this risk to want to have the opportunity to try the new technologies. So there's a bottom-up um, push that suggests that instead of thinking about research ethics and governance as moving cautiously, controlling the initiation of projects and access to market, that we should let things into the market um, with lower hurdles and then monitor more carefully what happens when they get there. Fueled partly by the idea that actually the model of the gold standard model, a randomized controlled trial, doesn't tell us very much about what to do in the real world. So how useful is it um, to actually build up this type of evidence base based on carefully selected cohorts uh, who are screened so that you don't have too many comorbidities? Uh, and there's a whole sense in which the assumption that we should distinguish and purify um, the research process in order to get stronger evidence before we go into the real world looks more suspect. It's largely driven by a sense of industrial purpose and intellectual property and it's poorly adapted to the desire to reuse existing medicines and a lot of charities in the cancer sector are particularly pushing um, the right to uh, try to see where the products they think might be useful might work and there's no particular interest of the patent owners to let them do that and again this is about breaking down the separation between the model we have about how things get to market uh, and how research should happen into some uh, sense of dealing with unmet needs. 
And of course, we have a number of non-standard environments that have led us to think about cutting corners or maybe adapting our research approach, depending on you're looking at it, research in outbreaks, um, learning from the combination of care uh, and the attempt to find some scientifically useful mechanism to drive forward David Cameron's commitment to the 100,000 genome projects. There are many more examples we could pick up, but the essence of this is that the model that thinks that the ethics of research is separate from the ethics of care um, is <coughs> much less um, clear to me than it was when I first started thinking. And then finally, there's a shift from the worries about um, things going wrong, the scandals and the mishaps, into uh, worries about the fact that we don't know what we need to know in order to deliver appropriate care. And I think you can pick that up in a number of uh, areas. We've built a model of research ethics and governance as a model of restraint. We worry that people might do things that uh, are abusive or exploitative uh, or insufficiently tried. And we've put in place a structure which is built on the idea of establishing some norms, some sets of principles and documenting them, Deprecation of Helsinki being our example for this evening. We then worry about whether or not people will um, set out to comply with those norms. And we created a gatekeeping process in terms of research ethics committees or institutional review boards uh, in some parts of the world. And then we worry about whether or not having been through the gatekeeping process, they actually do what they said they were going to do. Uh, and in response to scandals such as the North Staff scandal, we overlay a set of institutional responsibilities about research governance. And all of that is designed as a, uh, an approach to tackling people doing things wrong, malfeasance problems. But increasingly the discussion in policy circles is about why aren't we doing things that we need to do. So some of these you will be more or less sympathetic to. Um, so there's a worry about UK PLC's market share um, and what is it that had led to the reduction of trials being carried out in the European Union compared to uh, elsewhere uh, and about the UK share uh, in that process. Now in so far as that is uh, important to growing the economy, you might not be that um, sympathetic, or maybe you would be. But there are also ways in which we see that the uh, reasons why we've lost that share in terms of uh, the distribution of clinical trials are partly because the health research governance system has become so interested in itself and proliferated uh, that it may not add much ethical protection, but it does add considerable delay and transactions cost uh, into the approval processes. So I think there's a genuine question we need to ask there, if you like, about the ethics um, of, of ethics, about whether or not it does what it claims it's doing. We have a series of challenges um, about how supportive the public is of the research governance process and research ethics that we've set out. So one of the things that's claimed about Brexit, there are many things claimed about Brexit, but one is that we could escape from European red tape, of which the clinical trials, directive as was and regulations will be, uh, or the general data protection regulation in relation to the use of data, are seen as um, impositions from outside which are not necessarily um, wanted. I want to come back to democracy, if not necessarily Brexit, um, a little bit later on. And then there's a series of questions about whether or not our ethical frameworks, assumptions, governance processes actually create ethical problems as, uh, rather than solve them. So one of the bits of bioethics governance that I was involved with some years ago and I'm now a little bit ashamed of, uh, concerned the creation of guidance involving research uh, involving children with the British Pediatrics Association in the early 1990s. And we thought we were being very, we thought we'd been very liberal by moving from the idea that it was research involving children instead of research on children. So that's a bit like the shift from subjects to participants. We also thought we were being appropriately protective by saying that you, along with the MRC and various other groups, that it was inappropriate to carry out research involving children until you knew as much as possible uh, from studies involving adults. And then you should start with big children before you moved on to little children. Uh, and the consequence of that turns out to be in the economic structures we had, that the vast majority of care we give to children is unevidenced. 
because what we set up as being protective led to the fact that the evidence base for good quality care was not produced and we've had to address that by an extra layer of regulation uh, to force people to do the appropriate work uh, around children. Now we need to be able to ask questions about the unintended unethical consequences of the ethics that we put in place. One of the consequences of us focusing on interventions as the key model for uh, research ethics uh, is that we try and find out what those interventions do. So we create the randomised controlled trial as being the supposedly best, most unbiased way of, of singling out and extracting the consequences of the intervention. But of course no one ever gets that intervention in the abstract. And by focusing on that, we lose sight of a whole lot of other things that are going to be more important uh, when we come to use it. Um, so that's what I mean by the extent to which we get a high degree of insight into a not very useful area, and we create a whole load of shadow that blinds us to other things that we might want to know more about. And I think that's linked to this focus on uh, interventions. And of course, we have to ask ourselves the extent to which the governance systems we've created actually themselves are wasteful, um, uh, fail to encourage the appropriate levels of transparency and drive the extent to which some of our care is less well evidenced uh, as it should be. So rather than the first do no harm, uh, which is the uh, push on uh, avoiding doing things wrong and malfeasance, we also need to ask ourselves what good are we failing to do uh, that we need to do. And I don't believe that is simply uh, economic. So that's my thumbnail sketch of why I feel we need to ask the question uh, and look at things differently. We then need to think about why we should do things, uh, uh, how we should do things moving forward. And this is where I want to draw on the idea of a social contract and some elements of social contract theory uh, as being a process by which we could seek to find a way through um, the construction of a new paradigm. And I mentioned earlier that I think the story of Henrietta Lacks and her cell line, cell line that came from the cancer, not her, so we could have had an argument about whether it was alien to her or, or part of her, is a complex um, discussion. But one of the things that emerged was a challenge from Henrietta Lacks' family that as they began to sequence the cell line, they were all to be exposing information that would be about her family currently there and uh, open to uh, being newly exploited as well as information uh, about Henrietta. Uh, and in Sheila Jasnall's recent, recent book on the ethics of invention, she talks about the way in which the National Institute for Health tried to solve that problem through an agreement with the family, compromise with the family, which enabled them to put behind them and acknowledge the painful history uh, in order to make it possible to move forward and keep some of the research going by agreeing with them. The sense in which some of that information would be kept just within the scientific community and other things would be broadly available. So you've got a model then of a negotiation with stakeholders trying to address one of the historic um, challenges. So what I want to suggest to you is that we should think about the idea of a social contract uh, as a way of addressing this need for a shift in paradigm. Now, I don't want to think, I think they're straightforward and simple, but there are some characteristics of that approach that I think suggest it's the way we should get started. So first of all, I want to suggest that I don't think that social contract is entirely imaginary. Um, I apologize for using an English example, um, but we do have, in the English NHS, a document that is very much expressed in terms of a social contract. It was negotiated through um, a process of public professional service engagement events all around the country, uh, and it ends up with a rather grand claim that the NHS belongs to the people and it works at the limits of science, bringing the highest levels of human knowledge and skill to save lives and improve health. It would be very nice if that were true, um, but the point here is that we're not talking just hypothetically about the idea of a social contract. You can produce documents that look to be in that sort of form. The question is, why would we do it and how we might go about it? Well, first of all, I think a social contract approach uh, is interesting because it 
addresses the unilateralism um, that I picked up um, earlier, uh, which I see lying behind both the fragility of the social license and also the um, way in which the Declaration of Helsinki uh, is constructed as an offer, a beneficent offer by medicine um, to all of us. So we can work on this as a complex multilateral process. We can aim to link, therefore, the mutuality of uh, obligations and expectations together. We can find a way of mediating the free rider problem of why it is that people feel able to take the benefit of research but not be part of the uh, contribution to the evidence base uh, of the future. And a lot of that, I think, is built up to their lack of belief, appreciation, uh, acceptance of the link between care um, and, and research. <coughs> The idea of doing this through not the unilateral process of permission, but a mutual agreement, enables us to explore the extent to which we can hope for some form of win-win, that everybody agrees it's the right thing, or whether all we can really hope for is that people accept that even though they don't get everything they want, the trade-offs that are being made are ones that they can regard uh, as acceptable. Either way, we can take into account the fact that there may be conflicting interests without assuming that that has to be um, the only thing uh, that we look at. But most importantly, um, I'm interested in the idea that a social contract could give us greater stability over time, and I believe that's very important because I don't think we can do the type of research analysis that we need to do without being able to do it over significant periods and integrating data. So we have a lot of interest in personalised medicine, and there's a big paradox about personalised medicine, which is on the one hand, it's designed to be about me, and special to me, and different from me. And on the other hand, you can only deliver it by having a lot of information about everybody else to work out how I'm different. So on the one hand, personalised information is going to disaggregate information, and on the other hand, it can only work if people agree to pool it um, to enable it to be analysed. So if we really want to realise the promise of genomic medicine, we have to find ways of uh, convincing people that there are connections between the episodes of care and research we're inviting them to take part now, and the generality of the context which creates a sustainable uh, resource for analysis. And I think that's quite significant for the relatively established principle of research ethics that people should always be able to withdraw from research studies. Now, if you think about researchers' interventions, that makes a lot of sense. I don't like it very much, it's doing me harm, and the balance looks different, then of course I should be able to withdraw from that. But if you ask whether I should be able to withdraw my data, it's less obvious to me that um, I should be able to say, and you can't analyse what you have already. And it's certainly not obvious to me that if I've stopped you from being a participant in the study because I <coughs> volunteered to do it, say we were in the middle of an Ebola outbreak with a limited amount of research capacity, and I've said, please can I do this, because I think it might be a way of my getting this novel experimental drug. And then when I've got it, I say, that's enough, I don't want you to take any data from me or monitor what happens. I think I've breached a reasonable claim for the social contacts on that, because I've stopped somebody else who wanted to do that, and I've done it on the basis that I would be not just participating in gaming, but contributing to the common good for the research. So I think we need to be prepared to say, it isn't just about a lot of optimistic episodic choices. It is about a deal uh, of some sort. So that means that we can also use this idea of a deal to look more closely um, at the reintegration of the ethics of care uh, and the ethics of health uh, research. Um, the whole point of health research, it seems to me the public would agree, is to support improved clinical decisions. The way in which we're structuring our research ethics and governance contributes to the so-called crisis and evidence-based medicine by measuring things that are not then easy to translate uh, into practice. Um, and it's not just a system which is designed to give drug companies permission to access um, markets. Um, we measure things that are suboptimal if what we're trying to do is to make the link between research and care. And in particular, we build our models of research trials to satisfy regulatory requirements, especially around safety and efficacy. And we don't collect the data that then gets uh, used 
it will decide whether or not it's worth purchasing the product. So I don't know if you saw the Times this morning. Um, but the Times this morning has a threat from pharmaceutical companies to withdraw from the UK because the UK is not prepared to pay for these expensive new tools <coughs> um, that's going forward. So there's an example of a contract negotiation uh, in process. Uh, they see the opportunity in an election uh, and they're trying to use the threat to withdraw in the context of Brexit to persuade Theresa May to make 20 million more available for the health service uh, in England. But actually there is the plausibility of that claim relates to a, a principle in research ethics, which is that you should compare new products to the best available treatment. And in the context of the global pharmaceutical industry, if the UK doesn't offer the best available treatment, it's not meeting the so-called canons of research ethics. Of course, that really means the treatment that they would offer in America. Um, uh, and if we were asking that uh, elsewhere, and if we ask in what sense is it the best available treatment, do we know what gain we get from it? That you get a slightly different set of perspectives. But the point about this is that we have allowed separation between the canons of research ethics and what we really want to know and need in relation to delivering care. Um, we also need to think about the continuity between the learning uh, that we can get from routine care uh, and the research uh, agenda. If when I use my credit card, if I'm in the banking system, data about my usage is used in various ways. It's used to protect me from abuse by checking if there's an old pattern of uh, usage as to whether it's really me. I think I might do this while well. I say to Ben Moment there. So if, if my credit card company rings me up and say, did you use your credit card in a massage parlor in Edinburgh last week? Um, I have to decide what I'm going to uh, say about that. Um, there's a sense in which I would be able to say, in good faith, no, I didn't, I did right this morning. Um, uh, and it is a part of the service that the bank offers me that it monitors patterns to be able to see uh, anomalies. So that surveillance has a benefit um, to me. If you go on to Amazon, you will get the benefit of the personalization that comes with surveying your search habits and what other people have done, aggregating that and suggesting to you that if you like this, you might also um, like that. Um, we used to the idea that monitoring practice enables us to give better services. Um, because we think of the research exercise as different from the care exercise, we find that hard to make sense of uh, in our health systems. We also, because we separate out the idea of what counts as a proper research project and what counts as just trying to do something good for patients. Uh, we have very rigorous systems for approving research projects and no real systems for monitoring surgical innovation or just um, trying things. So we need to get a closer the strengths of our research ethics to explore the ethics that should go with innovation. Uh, and of all the things that were discussed in the Saatchi bill around uh, medical innovation, the idea that it should become the norm to record what we learn, to register it, was the one thing that we should hold on to. And finally, we need to pick up a better recognition that uncertainty is not only an issue in research ethics, it's also an issue in clinical care. There's a piece of work which will shortly be published by the Academy of Medical Sciences looking at the use of evidence uh, in decision making. And as part of that, they did they had Ipsos Mori do some public engagement role work. And what they learned from that was that the role that the public put on research and evidence was they thought it was all pretty straightforward. They thought their bit of the decision was to decide whether they thought the side effects were worth it. They thought the doctor would never recommend it to them if it wasn't going to work. And they had no sense that what lies behind clinical care is difficult judgments based on inadequate information about the circumstances that we're dealing with. So by pulling out the two, research and care, separately, uh, and thinking that uh, what we have is uncertainty that's addressed by research, and certainty that's applied in care, we've created more of a problem for ourselves that we need to try and uh, uh, re-engage together through some form uh, of conversation. Now, the reason why I think that's uh, interesting to do is that I think it gives us some hope that we could construct a better sense of common purpose uh, in the research exercise. So I'd like to talk about this uh, using the investment, uh, the metaphor of investing. 
you know, the basis being that uh, the investment in research now is the investment in order to secure the care that you want for yourself or your family or your friends uh, for tomorrow. And the argument is that, that actually there are many, many investors in the research enterprise and we only really think about investment in terms of industry, money chasing patentable um, products. But actually the participants involved in research are putting their bodies on the line, they're giving up their time, they're giving up some of their privacy and they're sharing personal data. The researchers have got reputations to protect, they're devoting intellectual capital, um, the funders, the uh, hosts uh, are doing that too, uh, and they're also then investing money. And if we think about, well, what's the point about this? The point about this is that we might have slightly different reasons for being interested in engaging this, but we're making investments and we should expect those investments to get returns of the form that we're <coughs> looking for. And any regulatory system or ethical framework that frustrates those investments needs to be considered uh, and challenged. So my job at the Health Research Authority uh, in England, although we do collaborate with uh, our colleagues in the other uh, countries, is largely driven by saying we should be proportional our regulation because if there are transactions costs in the research governance that don't deliver any benefit, that is frustrating the value of the investment that anybody is making. If it's too slow to get started, if we spend too much time in ethics committees, uh, unless we can explain why that adds value, we should be trying to strip it out. We've done a piece of work in the HRA um, looking at the number of times we duplicate checks and the amount of time in the pathway that no one's doing anything, they're just all waiting, you know, and how we can reduce those things, because those add no value whatsoever, they're just costs. Um, but we also need to think about the ways in which um, we frustrate this common sense of purpose by other sorts of restrictions. So the whole idea of patents and monopolies is a constraint on how we can use the information that's there. I was judicially reviewed for trying to use um, a cheap drug for macular degeneration instead of an expensive one. And the two drugs were both owned by the same American parent company. And there was no incentive to work out whether the cheap drug was as safe as effective because the economics of it meant that there was uh, a disadvantage of them in us discovering that. So it had to be a publicly funded trial. Uh, and we were under pressure from the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency because we were undermining the integrity of the protections in the governance system by not relying on the license um, process. Uh, and we were uh, um, challenged by the General Medical Council giving uh, obligations that you shouldn't use unlicensed products uh, when there were licensed ones available because that took away one of the protections that patients have um, against uh, uh, poor quality clinical practice. Um, now, we were, everybody knew that in this particular case, the evidence showed that it was as safe and as effective um, uh, and a tenth of the price. But the system that we've got uh, in there aimed to protect the integrity of research, the safety of access to the market, um, had actually frustrated that common purpose. Now, I think the same is true about patients and their data. The rules that we have about privacy and confidentiality serve to enable the drug companies who collect my data to lock it up with them uh, and not allow me to get the best return that I could get from being a participant in a research project. Because by linking it to the idea that this is for this project and not others, we've created a set of barriers that make it less easy to get the maximal return uh, on investment. And I think if you could open up a discussion about that, you would have the possibility then um, to explore the extent to which the social contract that we've manifested through Helsinki and its associated um, edifices um, actually captured the sense of what it's for and about um, that the public uh, expects. So how would you go about doing that? Well, I think if you look at theory uh, around social contract, um, and I'm borrowing here from work from a colleague at UCL, also my predecessor at the Nuffield Council on Bioethics as chair, about the sorts of questions we would need to ask then about a process by which might, we might construct uh, a new social contract. And remember, we know we can do things like this because we did it for the NHS constitution, but of course we might not do it in a way that would persuade us that it was appropriate. So Albert's review of the social contract literature 
you know, suggests that we should be, first of all, worried about the extent to which the people we are engaging in the discussion were free to actually commit themselves. Uh, and there's a whole set of questions that will come on that uh, in terms of representation. We need to make sure that the ground rules for debate in the, iron out some of the inequalities that are bound to be there. So if we were just going to talk in the modern context about the non-feasance and the economic case, you of course privilege, as the drug companies were pushing on the Times this morning, the voice of money. But if you look at what we did with the mitochondrial DNA replacement, what was privileged there was the voice of the families um, facing uh, challenges of mitochondrial disease. Uh, and then you create an environment in which they brought their kids to the House of Commons to see the MPs, uh, and you stacked the argument in a different sort of way. So we need to give attention to what the conditions would need to be to even out those uh, inequalities of participation. We need to try and disentangle the nature of the interests that are involved. I talked earlier about the difference between the win-win and the trade-offs. So we're seeking to explore to what extent there generally is a set of common interests, uh, and to what extent what we're trying to identify uh, is the set of interests that have to be held together uh, in relation to uh, the deal that's struck. We need sort of good faith requirement, which is that this will only work if people have an acceptance that if they engage in the collective project, <coughs> the purpose for doing that is to live with the results uh, at the end of it, and that's not necessarily easy to do. And we need to build into the process um, the recognition that people are going to need to change their position. So if it's not a position which involves it being responsive to the other party's views, it's not going to give us anything that is going to feel like a form of social contract. But most importantly, I think, the idea of social contract, at least in the democratic context, requires everybody to articulate their case, not merely to play their cards close to their chest. So this process of creating a social contract, if it's to get us to the sort of place um, that we need to get to, is not going to be a ballot box vote. It's got to be a deliberative process which is aimed to uncover the reasons that lie between things, and Albert describes this as deliberation aimed at truth. Now if we could construct that type of debate about the normative principles and the process that we had around research ethics, we could have some hope then that there would be um, a legitimacy to claiming that people should take notice uh, of what comes out. I see no reason why, as a participant, I should take very seriously what the World Medical Association says if I disagree with it. Um, but if I've been part of the process, um, if it's part of the process that articulates value, it enables to explore the extent to which either we can achieve a consensus or we can see compromises that we made as morally sustainable, moral compromises taken from a paper by my successor at the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, Professor David Orchard. Um, and the very fact of participating in those processes makes it possible to expect people to abide by um, the outcomes. Because if you've participated, you've accepted the obligations to be bound by it, they haven't just been imposed on you. It enables you to contemplate the fact that we may not get everything that we choose. It may be that if I want evidence-based care, I actually have to accept something I don't like. Or I think more plausibly, it may be that we can say that I don't have a set of independent choices, I have packages of choices, bundles of choices, so I can either have the well-evidenced, high-tech, responsive NHS, which uses my data intelligently, or I can have a low-tech, hit-and-miss, local discretion NHS, but keeps me um, uh, with a stronger protection for my privacy but I probably do not really commit exactly the way that I want it. And if we construct a process like this of discussion, we have some hope of pulling those new kids on the block who are not, who don't have any reason to be engaged in a medical model into the process of creating norms uh, and enabling them to feel that they are then part of and own the value system. We'll have to make some choices about what sort of social contract we're aspiring to. Uh, and Albert's book, draws out from the literature suggestion that we might think differently about whether we're looking for reasons for people to agree for this new model because it's better for them than the default. They don't have to agree on what those reasons are, they just have to think that if the system were to operate like this, I'm more comfortable with it than I am uh, at the moment.
And of course, that will depend on how comfortable you are with the Helsinki Declaration model and how well I persuaded you that you, you shouldn't be. Or maybe we do the sort of rules the end the practice position, which is we maybe could persuade everybody if they thought hard enough to think the same things were important, which seems to me slightly implausible. So, I hope then that in that process I've given you a sense of why it seems to me that if we do have to readdress the Helsinki model, we should seek to do it through some form uh, of social contract process. So, I hope then that um, you accept at least we should talk about some form of paradigm shift. Um, I should say that the only other time that I've had opportunity to pay tribute to Ken Mason's work was for a press trip some years ago, uh, and I wrote about the problem of establishing the legitimacy of medical law, and I suggested that we don't pay enough attention to the need to explain why it's okay to use law rather than some other processes uh, in this process, uh, in this regulatory universe. Um, and I suggested that one of the problems was that we can't explain how the use of coercive legal force is connected to uh, the moral values uh, that are at place. I've become more concerned then with trying to work out what is the nature of the challenge that we're dealing with in relation to bioethics governance. And I've got worried about whether or not it's enough to think about moral pluralism, that we have different views represented. The importance of thinking that it does matter whether or not those views are sound or not. So a concern first about pluralism and secondly about relativism. And since Brexit, I got very worried about nihilism as well. There may be no reasons for, for doing this. Um, and the reasons why I think the social contract approach um, is the right way to think about moving forward from this is that it does make it a question about the creation of social value. So it does try and get the connection between uh, what we're looking for and the normative structures. So I've argued to you that we need to renegotiate the social contract for health research that emerged post-Nuremberg after the Second World War. I've suggested that we need to reimagine what's at stake, partly because research practices have changed. I've argued that the contracting parties are very different now than they would have been if we'd asked this uh, after the Second World War, when self-regulation of health professionals um, was very much uh, the order of the day. Um, and now we need to include non-health researchers, patients, public, uh, data scientists, uh, Google, uh, all sorts of people, in order to try and create a satisfactory uh, negotiation. I've talked a bit about how we might try and approach that social contract process. All of which I think takes us a long way from both the content and the method of the Helsinki Declaration. Now I can't speculate what Ken would have made of that sort of argument. Um, uh, I think only physically met him once, although we corresponded. But my impression is that he'd have encouraged me to say something. He'd have probably made me laugh a bit about it, and he probably would have struck in some pretty telling constructive criticism uh, in the, the middle of that. But above all, I think, uh, I hope I've honoured the commitment that he made to trying to link the importance of moral thinking with the law. And he started uh, his book, now Graham's book, uh, with the frontispiece statement from Mr Justice Coleridge, the idea that every legal duty should be founded on uh, a moral obligation. And that's why I think we need to engage in a social contract discussion to try and maintain uh, that commitment to the foundation of uh, healthcare research and ethics and medical law and ethics in an understanding of a proper moral foundation for the use of the law. Thank you very much. very much. I can certainly confirm that Ken Mason would be particularly honoured by that, that, that final tribute. And thank you also for that wonderful illustration of what it means to be a public academic, taking on board all the experiences that you've got, bringing academic robustness to your analysis, but also making it incredibly accessible for us. We're going to take about 10 minutes to um, barrage Jonathan with questions, because there's lots of questions I'm sure that arise from, from, from that. I certainly have, have many, but I'm going to open up to the floor. Uh, Annie is going to run around helpfully, thank you, with the mic. Um, do we have any questions, comments? Thanks. Unlike Graham, I don't know everybody, so if people say where they're coming from, that would be helpful. Whether you turn that geographically or disciplinary. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Angus Ferguson from the University of Glasgow. 
Um, thank you very much. I really enjoyed that talk. Uh, a lot of uh, meat there to be chewed over uh, going forward. I was interested in whether or not you were presenting a model that was specific to the UK with the NHS, with all the data that is, is clearly generated in the public sector there and the extent to which it was applicable internationally, where so much research nowadays is international, but clearly you don't have that same healthcare model um, extending in other, uh, to other places. And even within a British context, the extent to which it would apply to private forms of medicine, and if that therefore challenged the kind of idea you said of, you would end up presenting people with a choice between either you're getting the public benefit of the, the health service, but sacrificing your data to that for whatever research needs arose in that context and effectively also creating a greater private market of people being able to or companies being able to say come to us and you can keep your data private and we'll give you the best standard of healthcare rather than the kind of poorer hit and miss healthcare that you suggested. Um, and I think the answer is all of those things are true um, and all of them we should engage with in different sorts of ways. So if we're thinking about the use of data, um, we have made a pitch that we could do really exciting things in the UK because we have a comprehensive health system which gives us two opportunities. Now, one is that we can collect the data uh, and the other is that we can give um, a, a wide reach of understanding what happens when you really try and use things in practice because everybody is within broadly the same system. The reality is we can't deliver on either of those, although you do it better on the first one in Scotland, but possibly partly because it's slightly under the radar in terms of data sharing. Um, uh, and, and we need to decide what we mean about it. So, so I would say in relation to data, there's a very big opportunity. You know, we screwed it up in relation to care data, but it wasn't that it was a bad idea. And you know, I think we could make a pitch that would persuade the public. Um, if we had the right people doing it, that actually they would gain from this. Because what we've created is a feeling that the discussions about use health service data were about exploiting people in the interests of financial government and companies. Um, but actually, most of the reason why people want to do it is because they think they will generate a better evidence base in order to produce higher quality care. And if that was what people understood the issue to be about, I think they think differently about it. Now, I think that's very much rooted in particular cultures. So I think we could do that in the UK, and I don't think you could do it in the States. But you can do it in the States, say, around um, a big teaching hospital. So John Hopkins can say, come to John Hopkins. Part of what we do is we're a learning organization. All our records go into a database. You know, and, and that's part of their offer. And that's socially acceptable because you don't have to do it. It's not socially acceptable to put, put it like that in the UK because no one has the chance to opt out of the system. So we have to win a different type of argument. So those things are quite culturally specific. Now, take another thing, something like the NBA research rule. Um, you've got a rather different type of decision then. So do we pitch the UK as saying, we don't care about embryos very much. You know, we are, we're pre quite prepared to research on them. We're prepared to contemplate um, uh, genome editing of human embryos. Um, you can't do that somewhere else. Come to the UK because our public 